a warm Doha greeting to you from the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. My name is Mehran Kamraba, and I am the head of the Iranian Studies Unit at the Arab Center. Since the 1978-79 revolution in Iran, Iran's relations with its Arab neighbors have been fraught. And particularly tense have been Iran's relations with the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council. In fact, by many accounts, the establishment of the Gulf Cooperation Council was truly meant to counter Iran's uh, export of revolution and its ambitions insofar as the Arabian Peninsula countries are concerned. These relations have not necessarily improved since 1978-79 despite the fact that on occasion, and for example, during the presidencies of uh, President Mohammad Khatami, there was a relative improvement in relations. In fact, President Ahmadinejad traveled to Saudi Arabia and the relations have had their ups and downs ever since. To help us better understand and navigate these relations, particularly Iran's relations with the GCC in the coming years, I can think of no one who's better positioned than our guest today, Dr. Sayed, uh, Sayed uh, uh, Hossein Musavian. Sayed Hossein Musavian is a Middle East security and nuclear policy specialist at Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs. He is someone whose scholarship and whose career I personally have followed with great interest and I have learned a great deal from him. He is a former diplomat who served as Iran's ambassador to Germany in 1990 from 1990 to 1997. He was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee of Iran's National Security Council from 97 to 2005. He was spokesman for Iran in its nuclear negotiations with the international community from 2003 to 2005. He was the foreign policy advisor to uh, the secretary of the Supreme National Security Council in 2000s, vice president of the Center for Strategic Research for International Affairs, general director of the foreign ministry for West Europe, uh, and of course, uh, chief of uh, parliament uh, administration and editor-in-chief of the English language Tehran Times uh, news uh, paper. More recently, Dr. Musavian has been a very prolific author. I personally am proud to have a copy of uh, Iranian nuclear crisis, uh, which uh, I hope to have at some point uh, personally autographed by, uh, uh, by Dr. Musavian. He has also authored uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, authored the book Iran and the United States: An Insider's View of uh, the uh, on the Failed Past and the Road to Peace. And he has just published in April of this year a book by Rutledge on uh, weapons of mass destruction, free zone in the Middle East. And indeed, he is the author of a forthcoming book on regional security here in the region. Before I turn it over to Dr. Musavian for his analysis of Iran's relations with the GCC, I should say that our talk today is available in both English and Arabic. Due to a technical uh, issue with Zoom, uh, if you click on the French button, you get the Arabic translation. Uh, French has been elevated to Arabic. We're also live, live streaming today on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube in the Arab Center's pages. Uh, Dr. Musavian has agreed kindly to take some questions after his uh, discussion, and so we're quite eager uh, to hear his analysis. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Musavian, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamrava. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I have been asked to speak a little bit slowly 
in order to uh, leave the room for interpreters to translate. Uh, the subject, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, have a very quick and short review with you today and to talk about it, is about a framework for a possible paradigm shift in GCC-Iran relations shifting from the current status quo, which is uh, based on tension, animosity, uh, and confrontation to uh, a friendship, cooperation, and partnership. This is uh, the, the main issue I'm going to discuss today. Actually, Iran and GCC uh, have had always two options on the table. One is a relation based on confrontation, and the second, uh, a relation based on cooperation and partnership. For decades, practically, we have experienced option one. I mean, Cold War between Iran and GCC, animosities, blame game, and rivalries. And we all understand our region is already fed up with the crisis, multiple crises, from wars to civil wars, sectarian war, terrorism, and so on. One of the reasons of, of the current situation in this region is uh, the confrontational uh, policies between Iran and GCC. It is not all, but at least one, one of the reasons. I believe enough is enough. And uh, I want uh, to suggest to Iran and GCC to try the second model for the next decade. The, the, the model of cooperation and partnership. In order to open the door uh, for the second model, understanding five factors would be really essential to furnish cooperation and partnership between Iran and GCC. The first factor is uh, the mutual blame game. For decades, both parties have been uh, hostage of uh, blame game. Each other, they only blame the other side. Uh, all countries definitely have mutual grievances, either between Arabs and Persians or among Arabs and Arabs. We have at least equivalent amount of tensions and problems between Arabs and Arabs in the Persian Gulf countries and Arabs and uh, Persians or Iranians. The first important issue is to respect this fact and decide uh, to, to, to understand each other side, the other side, to understand the grievances, the concerns the other side on has, not only just blaming. The second factor is uh, zero hegemony. This region would be able to have a relation based on cooperation and partnership if everyone agrees on zero hegemony. Neither hegemony, neither by a regional country, whether this is Saudi Arabia or Iran, nor by external powers, whether this is the US or China or Russia. The third uh, factor is security for all, the concept of security for all. Sustainable and long-term security would be achieved with objective of security for all. Security at the expenses of insecurity of other neighbors practically means and would mean stability and hostility to continue for indefinite period. We need to understand the, this concept very well. We need to come back to, a, to, come, to come to a situation that Iranians would feel the security of Saudi Arabia is part of security of Iran. Saudis would understand the Iranian security is part of security of Saudi Arabia. And this concept would be uh, uh, mutually accepted uh, and practice 
between all countries around the Persian Gulf. The fourth uh, issue factor is a grand bargain. I don't believe piecemeal approach would lead us to a collective cooperation. We need a collective cooperation. Many people for years, they are discussing about grand bargain between Iran and the US. I believe the priority is grand bargain between Iran and GCC and Iran, the eight countries around the Persian Gulf. And it is possible. In order to achieve a collective cooperation, I mean economic, political cooperation, cultural security, and military, all aspects and dimensions of a very good relations. The last factor is uh, the concept of multilateral approach. I don't believe unilateralism would be the solution. I don't believe uh, bilateral agreements would not be solution. I believe we need uh, P8 plus P5. What I mean by P8, I mean uh, uh, eight countries around the Persian Gulf. Iran, Iraq, GCC, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Emirates, and Oman, eight countries. And P5, the five permanent members of United Nations Security Council because uh, practically, United Nations Security Council is the highest body internationally responsible for maintaining peace and security worldwide. And if there is any agreement, it should be multilateral, a dialogue between P8 and P5, and it should be ratified by United Nations Security Council to become a resolution, to become mandatory for every country, especially the countries in the region. The plan, my second part is about uh, a plan. What plan can lead us to such a co uh, collective cooperation and partnership? The plan should be uh, to establish, to work to establish uh, Persian Gulf Security and Cooperation Organization, uh, comprising of uh, six members of GCC, uh, plus Iran and Iraq based on 10 principles, which I'm going to present to you in, in, in short and as outline and very uh, in very uh, summary. Principle number one, respect for A, sovereignty, B, territorial integrity, and C, international borders, respecting international borders. The second principle is relations based on ABC again. A, mutual respect, B, mutual interest, and C, equal footing. It doesn't matter how big a country is or how powerful it is. The members of eight uh, countries within this organization they should have equal rights and equal footing to, to uh, determine the destiny of, of uh, themselves and the region. The third principle is uh, non-interference in internal or external affairs of each other. Iran and GCC, they have been blaming for at least 40 years about interferences. Iran has been complaining about interfering in internal affairs of Iran to bring regime change, and GCC, Saudi Arabia, they have been complaining about interfering in internal affairs of GCC to export Iranian revolution or to bring regime change. And they can give you a long list of blame, uh, I mean, uh, complaints about interferences. The fourth uh, uh, principle is uh, rejection of threat or use of force. Definitely uh, countries, they have uh, uh, problems between each other. Even if you go to uh, one of the most successful uh, organizations, uh, which they have been able to create a regional cooperation system, 
is EU, European Union. And they have really done well. They brought uh, wars between the three big powers, France, uh, UK and Germany, peace, and now they have no border. They are cooperating on everything. However, there is disputes between countries, but they have decided to not to use, uh, not to threat each other, not to use force to sit and to talk and to manage the crisis and differences through dialogue and diplomacy and cooperation. Principle number five is organizing a joint security system. One of the biggest problem uh, of our region is about security. And this organization should establish a joint security system to cooperate on common security concerns, such as terrorism, ex -terrorism uh, extremism, sectarianism, organized crime, drug trafficking, and so on. Uh, the sixth principle is to establish a joint military task force, again, uh, for three uh, issues. To ensure uh, uh, energy and security, uh, energy and maritime security, A, B, to prepare the ground for gradual withdrawal of foreign forces from the region and the transition to the provision of security <clears throat> by the regional countries. This task force should be responsible for maintaining security of the Persian Gulf. And C is signing a non-aggression pact that these countries, they would never invade each other. They would never attack each other for any reason, by any means. Principle number seven is organizing a comprehensive plan for political, security, economic, cultural, and military relations. Principle number eight is to establish WMD free zone in the Persian Gulf and to cooperate to achieve WMD free zone in the Middle East. One of the biggest problem between these countries is a concern about weapons of mass destruction. If they are afraid about Iranian nuclear capability, it is about possibility of diversion toward weaponization. They are afraid one day Iran may divert its program toward weaponization. And that's why I believe we should think a little bit broader than the nuclear. We should think about establishing a, a, a WMD free zone in the Persian Gulf, while in parallel, we all cooperate to, uh, to bring a WMD free zone in, in the Middle East, including Israelis which ultimately they have to dis dismantle their nuclear bombs since Israel is the only country in this region with nuclear bombs. No other country has nuclear bombs. Unfortunately, nobody is talking about Israeli nuclear bombs and all pressures and blames are on Iran, which does not have nuclear bombs. Number 10 is about organizing a conventional arms arrangement. This is again one of the biggest problems. You have heard a lot about Iranian missiles capability and they are the, the GCC and the other regional countries, they are afraid they may be attacked a day by Iranian missiles. However, the range of Iranian missiles is a maximum 2000 kilometers. While Saudi Arabia, they have missiles with the range of 3,500 uh, 3, to 5,000 kilometers. Saudis, they have missiles with a longer range, uh, almost double size of Iranian missiles. But again, nobody is talking about those missiles. They are only talking about Iranian missiles. Iranians are complaining why the US has militarized the region by exporting hundreds of billions of dollars of arms to this region. 
And at the end, because of the arms race, I believe the region is the main loser or countries or nations are the main losers because the sources, all resources should go to economic development of our countries, not to fight each other, not to buy arms because uh, uh, importing arms would not bring us security. Uh, would uh, practically help the security of arms exporters, not our security. If it was supposed to bring security for our region, the trillions maybe during last 40 years, 25% of all uh, uh, arms exports is to our region by GCC countries. But still they feel unsecure and they need to rely on the foreign forces. Therefore, I believe we need a, a regional arrangement for conventional arms arrangement uh, in order to balance, to synchronize, to equalize the, the, the power <clears throat> of each country on the arms. If the country, if, if, if we are supposed to agree on missile with the range of 2,000 kilometers, everybody should have and nobody should exceed, uh, uh, exceed 2,000. If we agree on 5,000, it should be a regional agreement. If we agree on 1,000 kilometer, everybody should agree. This is the 10 principles, I believe, with uh, these principles and the five factors which I introduced in a very summarized way, we can move, we can shift these nasty hostile relations between all neighbors in, in our region to, to a friendship, uh, cooperation and partnership. How we can begin? I believe the, the first uh, uh, step uh, should come and the most important step should come from United Nations Security Council because they are responsible for maintaining uh, peace and security in, in the world, including Middle East and the Persian Gulf. When we are talking about the security in Persian Gulf, this is the... the, the uh, duty and the task of United Nations Security Council. Fortunately, uh, two days ago, there was a talk on the security in Persian Gulf at the ministerial level. Uh, I listened, it was very fruitful uh, discussion, although some countries, they objected, but discussing this issue is one of the most important issues. I know by fact that the UN Secretary General is willing to initiate a, a move uh, to start such a dialogue between countries to bring a collective security system to Persian Gulf. I know uh, he is very much willing. I know the staff of United Nations, uh, they are really willing. They believe, and you, you, you may, you can understand uh, the objection of which countries may have uh, prevented them to go forward. Therefore, I believe the United Nations Security Council should adopt a new resolution to give a mandate to Secretary General to initiate a regional dialogue forum to commence discussion on a broad spectrum of security and cooperation in this region. I have been uh, uh, talking with many friends in GCC at the level of ministers or lower. Uh, they say any agreement with Iran we cannot trust because Iran is a very powerful country and a very big country, and it may break the agreement. That's why I, I believe uh, the venue should be United Nations Security Council, because first of all, this is their duty, and this is their main task. Second, the best guarantor for every possible arrangement, every agreement should be and could be the United Nations Security Council, 
with approving a resolution and then uh, determine mechanism for correct and precise implementation of the agreements. That's why I believe uh, 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 the, the UN Secretary General would get a green light uh, from the United Nations Security Council. As far as I know, Europeans, Chinese and Russians, they are in favor of such idea. The Trump administration is against uh, because they are happy with uh, sending, selling hundreds of billions of dollars of arms in order to create job and money for the US. Uh, we understand all this, but uh, if there is a chance after the US election, whether President uh, Trump or Vice President Biden would win, I think this would be in long term for the interest of every country, including Americans, because they want to leave the region, but they cannot leave this region in vacuum. The orderly and, and responsible departure is needed and we don't like and we should not like for the u.s to leave and another superpowers to come in before brits they were dominating the persian gulf they left and now for decades americans do they want to leave and another superpower comes no i believe this is the time for our eight countries to rely on, uh, on their nation, their capability, their resources, self-confidence, by creating confidence building measures with a roadmap, which I introduced today. Of course, it is, I cannot claim this is a very complete roadmap, but it, uh, there are some elements which definitely would be very useful to start to build such a regional cooperation like what Europeans, they did. Uh, the second important issue as uh, a, a, a plan of action or to start would be for GCC and Iran uh, to tone down hostile rhetorics. They, they, they need really to try to adopt peaceful language in public discussion toward each other because I have heard many, many humiliative statements from both parties against each other, which really this is not good for any Muslim to hear uh, such a humiliation for another Muslim or Muslim country. Therefore, I believe uh, a ceasefire on uh, hostile, uh, propaganda, hostile rhetorics, hostile uh, statements are really important in order to help the atmosphere to, to change to a positive or a cooler atmosphere. And I, I, I think uh, if Biden is elected, he most probably he would be uh, positive for such a uh, idea and as far as i understand in discussion i have had uh, uh, with many gcc countries my understanding is that qatar is uh, ready kuwait is ready uh, oman is ready and uh, emiratis although in public they are not but in private they are ready and we have practically Saudi Arabia because Bahrain uh, always is following Saudi Arabia and the Trump administration. Uh, I hope our Saudi brothers also, they would come to a conclusion that uh, peace, stability and security, partnership, friendship, cooperation is the best guarantor for the next generation of uh, all uh, countries in this region. Uh, Dr. Kamrava, I prefer to stop and leave enough time for questions and answers if they have. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Musavian. This was an excellent and comprehensive uh, plan of action as to how to move forward, uh, very detailed. May I ask, have you presented this at various forums, whether academic or policymaking uh, circles? Yes, uh, actually, Mehran uh, 
this is something I am discussing uh, for over 10 years before Dr. Rouhani administration, during Ahmadinejad, during Khatami, uh, in seminars, conferences. Uh, the reason I told you my understanding is that China, Russia, Europeans, they are in favor is because I have been in many, many, many conferences and I have seen the positive reaction to this concept. The reason I say I remember it was about maybe eight years ago in Doha, I presented this idea uh, to in a forum in Doha. And I presented this idea when I was in, in uh, uh, Bahrain uh, about seven, six, seven years ago. Uh, but after I presented, I mean, they uh, banned me from entering Bahrain and they don't like to hear uh, such a good statements. Uh, however, two years ago, uh, I had a chance to attend a conference in Abu Dhabi. And again, I raised the reason I say also, the reason I said my understanding is that uh, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, uh, Oman, uh, and even Emiratis, uh, uh, they are ready is because of the discussion I have had over 10 years in different seminars and conferences. With Americans also, as far as I'm living about 10 years in the US, and I attended hundreds of conferences, there are two school of thought uh, Mehran. One school of thought is practically saying that sustainable cooperation uh, would be uh, possible if the regional countries, they take responsibility and go to friendship and the U.S. interest is to withdraw from this region to focus on the Eastern powers, pivot to East, because the US understands very well that the main competitor of United States is not neither Iran or nor Saudi Arabia nor Qatar. The real competitor is China and India. That's why they believe the long-term interest of the United States is to pivot to East, to focus on Eastern powers, and although uh, also uh, because they don't need any more oil. For decades, the US strategy in our region was oil. The religion was oil. Everything was about oil, dominating the oil. Now they don't need oil. Now they are number one and one exporter of gas and oil worldwide. This is one school of thought in the region. There is uh, the second school of thought which the radicals of Israelis, not all Israelis, because 70% uh, of Jews in the US, the majority of Jews in the US, they are in favor of the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal. They are in favor of two state solution, a state as uh, independent state of, for Palestinians. And I believe majority of Jews living in Israel, they are. Therefore, when we are talking about Israel, we are not talking about uh, all Israelis or Jews. There are those radicals like, I mean, I mean like, like Netanyahu or Zionists, which they believe in supremacy of Israel in the Middle East. They want first to fix the supremacy of Israel and then let the U.S. go. That's why they are very happy. I believe they have been involved in collapsing, uh, bringing Muslim powers like Syria, like Libya, like uh, <clears throat> Iraq to a collapse. And they are pressuring the other countries like Turkey, Iran to weaken them because they are after supremacy of Israel in the Middle East. This is the second school of thought in which they have some supporters in the US like uh, John Bolton, you know, like neocons, like Tea Party. Uh, that's why they really don't want any friendship, any rapprochement between Tehran, Riyadh, between Tehran, GCC, even between Tehran, Baghdad, even between Baghdad and Riyadh, you know. They don't like any type of friendship in this region 
they enjoy the dispute and fight and confrontation between Muslim countries to fix their own supremacy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Musabian, it strikes me that your plan is far more realistic, far more measured and comprehensive than what Tehran uh, is officially proposing these days, which is the HOPE initiative, the Hormoz uh, Peace Endeavor uh, initiative. Do you see any viability for this plan? Uh, I understand the difference between my plan and the discussion in Tehran, but uh, I'm sure about one thing, Dr. Kamraba, because the first time the proposal of regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf was raised by Iran in 1985, my brother. And it was the time uh, during the war, you remember? It was the time, unfortunately, if not all, many GCC countries, they were supporting Saddam invasion of Iran. Right after the war, I was ambassador in Germany and late foreign minister Genscher paid visit to Iran in 1991. I was with him in the meeting with Rafsanjani and Genscher proposed a regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf, like a regional cooperation system Europeans have established, EU. And Rafsanjani immediately supported and gave him a carte blanche. He sent his foreign minister Velayati to every GCC countries to inform that, them that Iran is ready. It was one time, it was during the war. Immediately after war, Iran, rather than to uh, go for compensation, hostility with GCC countries, uh, because they supported Saddam, they offered a regional cooperation system for cooperation and friendship. It was in 1991. And I, I tell you, Genscher was shocked how powerful Iran supported. I tell you, he came back and with a lot of hopes, he went to Washington and Washington, they told him, this is none of your business, get out. That's why I believe Iranians, they understand the fears if they don't talk about it. They, they understand the fears and they understand that uh, hegemony is not going to work. They understand a long-term sustainable uh, economic development, welfare, peace for everyone and needs a full engagement with the regional countries and to remove every concerns they have. Since this is, this is the understanding on the Iranian side, I believe uh, if there is a differences between my proposal and the proposals, ideas you hear in Tehran, I think there would be a solution for Tehran's flexibility to come more flexible. This is comforting to hear because sitting here in Doha, I often I get the impression that in Iran, the concerns that are raised here are dismissed as uh, mere misunderstandings, whereas here in, in, the, uh, in, in a place like Qatar and across the GCC, there is a genuine existential fear about Iran. And you're, tell, you're saying that, this, that there is an awareness in Tehran of this fear uh, towards Iran. Is that correct? My friend, we are both academics. And if you go to our brothers in Riyadh, and give them a list of Iranian concerns about the Riyadh policy. They would say, no, this is misunderstanding. <laughs> but I assure you, they understand. And Iranians also, they understand. I believe they understand. However, none of them is going to officially recognize as long as the other side is not recognized the concerns, you know, of the other side. Right. The reason I say, rather than blame game, this was my first point, 
we need to enter to reality process. We need to understand that concerns are reality. Some of them are legitimate. Some of them may be uh, misperception or misunderstanding. It doesn't mean every complaint is correct, but definitely you would find legitimate concerns and grievances in every side. If we enter to a process to open our hearts and to hear from the others and to respect and to understand. Uh, and that I think is key. How does one break this wall of mistrust? The first uh, principle you laid out was mutual understanding and, uh, and, and having a sense of trust. How does one take that first step? Is it through heroic diplomacy uh, in the way that Sadat did when he flew to Tel Aviv in 1977? Is it through the Iranians uh, saying we're willing to go to Riyadh with no precondition or the Saudis saying we're willing to go to Tehran with no precondition? How does one take that initial leap of faith uh, whereby then you open future doors? Actually, um, I need to make a correction. The first principles I proposed was uh, a respect for sovereignty, a territorial integrity, and international borders. But what you mentioned and I mentioned, the first important factor was about uh, ending mutual blame game. I believe, Dr. Uh, if we are going to find solution, we need to understand the problem. As long as we don't understand the problem, how we can find the solution? If we erase every problem and then we don't need solution, therefore we need to understand there is a problem. There is fear, there is concern, there is uh, uh, grievance. There are many grievances and concerns. We need to understand this just to be able to find solution. This is my point, Hector. Solution without understanding the problem is impossible. The political willing would be the key. And I tell you my own experience in 19, mid 1990s when uh, late uh, King Abdullah was uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia and his power like uh, very much like the power of uh, Mohammed bin Salman today practically was running the country uh, and they met I mean he met with Rafsanjani in the uh, Islamic organization conference and they decided because the both leaders, they had good willing to make the relations. The willing, the political willing is the key. And then uh, uh, Amir Abdullah asked Afsanjani to send an, uh, a special envoy. That's why I was called from Bonn to go to, 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 go to Tehran. And the late president of Sanjani told me you would go to negotiate with uh, Amir Abdullah, the crown prince, as my special envoy. When I went there, the atmosphere was not official diplomatic talks, which we are not going to take to anywhere. He took me to in his home, private home. And we sat together and we started to raise the complaints, grievances, the concerns. But both of us, we had good ear to hear and try to respect. And then we started to negotiate about the solutions. And after four days of negotiations, every day, maybe four, five, six hours, I could agree with Amir Abdullah, a comprehensive plan of action to rebuild Iran-Saudi relation, which you mentioned at the introduction, it was uh, the, the last, year of Rafsanjani when we agreed and then it was agreed also when I brought the plan to Tehran they all agreed and uh, it was practically implemented during President Khatami because Rafsanjani period was over. Therefore political will would be very important 
Second, if we are going to find a solution for the problems, we need to understand the problems. Right, right. Um, I, uh, there's a question uh, from uh, audience members and it asks, uh, what are the consequences of Saudi Arabia and Iran's involvement in proxy conflicts and rivalry on your proposed security plan? Uh, actually, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talks, part of the problem of the crisis we have in this region is animosity, hostility between Iran and GCC, part, not all. I mean, because I, always I have told Americans that uh, your policy uh, is and had been and would be the main problem because your policy is based on war. You attacked Iraq, you attacked uh, Libya, you attacked uh, Afghanistan. I mean, you, your policy is war and bullying. And all these wars have dismantled these countries, creating millions of uh, uh, refugees or hundreds of thousands of people uh, dead or injured and terrorism, the rise of terrorism. I have told them this is the problem number one, but I don't want to blame practically and friendly and sincerely. I don't want to blame everything on America. And we should, we countries in the Persian Gulf also should recognize the fact that we are also responsible. Animosities, hostilities, rivalries between Iran and Saudi Arabia is one of the problems in this region. And second, in my principles, I propose to establish a security system, a joint committee, to address the security issues. I mean, uh, I mentioned terrorism, I mentioned sectarianism, uh, or every conflict, you know, extremism, definitely Iranians, they have problem about uh, uh, the, the, the uh, proxy groups uh, affiliated to Saudi Arabia, about their extremism, and definitely Saudi and GCC, they would have the same complaint and concern about Iran. That's why I believe this is what I experienced in my negotiation with late uh, Amir Abdullah. I mean, when we complained each other about security issues, interfering in internal affairs of each other, he was telling me, you are interfering in Shia affair of, of Saudi Arabia. I was telling him, yes, but if it is true, then you are interfering in Sunni affairs of Iran. And then he said, okay, these are the list of security concerns. Okay, then we establish a sec joint security committee. It's six months they sit together, they bring the documents and they resolve. And because we have agreed on non-interference. I mean, that's why in my principles, I propose the joint security concern because I understand there is real security concern by each country in this region. I have a question from an audience member asking, what caused the collapse of that security agreement that you put together uh, with the Crown Prince at the time? Uh, nobody is talking about, but uh, I think the main initiators of uh, this peace uh, agreement, they, it was uh, King Amir Abdullah and Rafsanjani. And I believe uh, King Abdullah was very much disappointed when Afrasanjani left and was completely isolated. And he was concerned whether he would be able to continue such a peace strategy with Ahmadinejad or not. I believe Ahmadinejad would, be, would have been cooperative. Although he, he didn't like me, although he, he put me in jail, but I want to be fair. I believe he was for good relation with Saudi Arabia, although some of his statements was not helpful, you know. You need to, to control your, your, your rhetorics. And nevertheless, 
The second problem actually, and I think it was a real problem, was the rise of Iranian uh, nuclear crisis. When Iran mastered enrichment, when it was international crisis, and uh, you know, then uh, it, it, it was a reason of fear in the Persian Gulf countries. It was a reason of fear in Europe, in US. And the third, I would say, during President Ahmadinejad, unfortunately, Iranian foreign policy was in problem in general, you know. It was not only about the region, with European, with Western countries, and it was a general problem. Uh, nevertheless, this is a precedence. Uh, it worked for 10 years. But the reason I said in my talks, because I didn't have and I don't have time to go to explain everything, the reason I said piecemeal approach or only bilateral agreement would not work because it was Iran-Saudi. And that time I told late uh, Amir Abdullah, King Abdullah, that we need to agree with other GCC countries. And definitely we need to agree with Iraq, but he was right. He told me with Iraq, with Saddam, neither you nor us, we cannot talk to him. You know, that, that time there was a problem. Right, right. And so looking five years down the line, as, as we wrap up, uh, Dr. Musabian, looking five to 10 years down the line, uh, how do you see Iran GCC relations? What's your prognosis? You know, uh, frankly speaking, doctor, I'm very much afraid about Israeli intentions. Always I have been concerned about American policy, although for the US, either Democrats or Republicans, in Middle East, everything is about Israel. I mean, the, 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 the most important issue for them is Israel. Uh, that's why I have been always concerned about American foreign policy, not to have a balanced policy between Palestinians and Israelis, between Muslim countries and Israel, always giving a carte blanche to Israelis to whatever they want to do in this region. But now I'm more concerned that Israelis, they have entered directly, and I hope uh, our neighbors, our friends in the Persian Gulf would understand that every eight country has been there for decades or centuries. And they are going to stay not for the next five years, doctor, or not 50 years, for 500 years, for 5,000 years. And they need to agree among themselves. They are one family. They are living in one home and they have to be responsible for the security of their homes and prevent the foreign interferences, whether this is a regional power or there is an international power. Dr. Musabian, you have given us uh, much insight uh, and, and a very comprehensive plan of moving forward. I am truly grateful to you. I have one last question. When this whole COVID business is over, Will you honor us with your presence here at the Arab Center so we can enjoy your insights and uh, expertise in person? Anytime, doctor. Believe me, good relation between Iran and GCC. Every country of GCC, including Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, is in my heart. And I know Qatar has been always, uh, especially during last years, very, very much active in order to bring such a long-term stability. I really appreciate friends in Doha and I would be very much willing to come anytime possible to meet you in person and to talk to our friends in Doha. Excellent. And then uh, we have the audience. I'm going to hold you to it because I definitely want this book uh, personally autographed. So, definitely. My uh, pleasure, uh, Victor. I would do it. Honored. Uh, you can. Thank you again very much, Dr. Musabian, for uh, enlightening us with your analysis of Iran's relations with the GCC. And my sincere thanks to our audiences 
here in Qatar and worldwide for having joined us. From the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, have a good evening. Thank you very much, Doctor, and to all Arab uh, Center friends in the Arab Center. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.